John 1, we got uh, just to verse 18 last week, but like I said, John 1 is uh, small but mighty, the way he starts out. It's just a giant, really, uh, the way he starts out. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, There's an atheist who was arguing with a Quaker about the existence of God. And the atheist said, hey, have you ever seen God? And the Quaker said, nope. Well, have you ever smelled God? And the Quaker said, nope. Well, have you ever even heard God's voice? Nope, said the Quaker. And the atheist with a kind of a smirk on his face, then how can you be sure that there is a God at all? And the Quaker thought for a second, and they said, friend, hast thee ever seen thy brains? <laughs> no. Hast thee ever smelled thy brains? No. Then how can you be sure that you have brains? <laughs> Some think that they can see God, and then there'd be evidence of his existence. Um, you know, if we could just see him, then we'd believe, then we'd believe. But remember what John 20, uh, you know, we learned from Thomas's moment when Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. But he said, blessed or happy are they that have not seen and yet believed. So even if you can't see your brain, there is an outside evidence that you have one, at least for most people. I'm joking, but yeah, there's evidence that there's a thinker in there, unless you're a zombie just walking mindlessly around, I suppose, but there's clear evidence, even as we see clear evidence that there's, uh, you know, there's God in creation. Um, even creation speaks of his glory, Romans 1 tells us. Um, Genesis uh, begins as John's apostle, epistle, or letter, you know, gospel, b- begins in the beginning. That's a big beginning talking just the same way as Genesis 1.1. And last week we began to see um, in the beginning God, but as we see Jesus, we're gonna see these titles that were given to Jesus, even here in John's gospel. Titles that are important for us to know. And we, we started into that list last week. Um, the, 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 the titles given to Jesus, I, the first one that we saw was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's uh, the first title we saw. And then we saw Jesus given the the title of the light. Um, John the Baptist said, uh, you know, I am not the light, but he is the one who's going to be the light there. um, In fact, John, we saw in verse seven, uh, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, Jesus, uh, there in verse seven. Um, Also verse nine, that Jesus would be the true light as he's called there. So we start to see some of these titles. Now, by the way, um, kind of sandwiched in there in verse 17, we saw that key phrase, something that the Gospel of John is gonna employ several times, and that is the concept of grace and truth. Um, Like verse 17, grace and truth came by Jesus. And so uh, that's something we should mark and note, and we looked at that. Remember, we need both. We need grace and truth. Grace without truth would be deceitful and not even honest. Um, but truth without grace would be condemning and devastating to us all. How thankful I am that Jesus is the one who's come with grace and truth. We're saved by grace. And uh, by the way, we also live by grace. There's, there might be some who will try to say, oh, you're saved by grace, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you've got to do the law and keep rules and regulations and do, do, do. Um, but I got to remind us, uh, you're saved by grace, but that's also the way you stay saved. I hope you understand that. Don't let anybody tell you, well, you're saved by grace, yeah, but then there's, there's stuff you gotta do in order to be saved. Um, uh, the Bible teaches that you're, you're saved by grace, but you're also, you stand in your salvation in by grace. Um, and that's an important thing to note. First Corinthians 15, 10, by the way, um, Paul makes this declaration, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Not I, I am, you know, or, or I, I am what I, you know, not, didn't used to be. Um, no, I, he's, by the grace of God, presently, Paul's saying, I am what I am, and his grace, which is bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul was one who did a lot of good stuff, good works, 
But Paul didn't stand in his works. He stood in grace. And that's something that we see. But I love that phrase, by the grace of God, I am what I am, uh, present, presently speaking. So John in verse 17, one thing that we didn't really cover that much last week, but we'll see, is pointing out a new order that would have been new to the Jews. Um, you know, the Jews knew about the law and you had to be keepers of the law. This would be, you know, grace and truth. What does that all mean? This is a new introduction for uh, the, the Jewish reader or hearer of John. Um, you know, he's pointing out a new theological order, being saved by grace and not by works of the law as the Jews would have thought. So we began this discussion um, and we started talking about these in the titles of God. But the third, the third one that we sort of started diving in is this title given to Jesus, the Son of God, um, the pre-existing Son of God, by the way, um, which is interesting because uh, there in verse 15, we saw, you know, it says, he cometh after me is preferred before me. He was before me. Um, what's John saying? John was six months, five or six months older than, uh, than uh, Jesus was chronologically. How then could he say Jesus came first? Um, the answer is uh, in the beginning was the word, verse one. Uh, and verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the idea. So how do we get the idea of the son of God and, and the only begotten? We saw in verse 18, he's called verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. So this idea of the son of God, we talked about that. How can there be a son of God and a father God? Uh, is that two? Uh, and the answer is yes, two parts of one. Uh, the Holy Trinity, it's, uh, we talked a little bit about that, the mystery of the Trinity. Um, and that's an important thing to note that um, we talked about outside of time and space, God the Father. Um, and, and this is, by the way, how we answer that question we ended last week with that sort of controversial scripture there in verse 18, where it says, no man hath seen God at any time. Um, the only begotten son was the uh, uh, in the bosom of the Father. So um, the, the cynics, the skeptics will say, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. And here's one of them, that no man has ever seen God. And I showed you a bunch of scriptures last week where people saw God, the God of Israel even. It says they saw the God of Israel uh, in, in Exodus and other places. Quiz time, question, see if anybody was listening last week. I know it was getting late last week, but um, if people, you know, if no man can see God and live, and yet it says in the Old Testament, people saw God and the atheist saying, see, the Bible's full of contradiction. What's the simple answer to that? Anybody? Yeah, the, the Jesus, if somebody said, Jesus, that's right, it's Jesus. See, because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, I would make it a statement this way. No man can see God the Father and live, um, but you can see God the Son. And in the Old Testament, it's called a Christophany or a theophany, a Old Testament appearance of Jesus. Well, how can Jesus appear before he was born in Bethlehem? Remember, before, before the creation of the earth, Jesus was. Remember, we saw that, uh, John makes that point. Um, now, some of you, I know you're thinking, well, Brett, well, if, if no man can see God and live, then how are we, when we die and go to heaven, we're gonna go into heaven and we're gonna have to stand before the throne of God. How are we gonna see God and live? Well, remember, you're already dead. You're completely dead. You're not gonna get deader uh, when you stand before God in heaven. Do you understand that? That's an important thing. It's, it's after you die, then you will stand before the throne of God. I'm not being uh, uh, sarcastic here. I'm being, uh, we'll all have, by the way, new bodies uh, and, and we'll be able to sustain seeing the Father in heaven with our new bodies. Uh, that's gonna be a glorious thing. So um, people that say, you know, the, the Bible's full of contradictions, usually it has to do with them not really understanding the way the Bible works and what the Bible actually says. So very important. We also discussed Jesus, you know, being the son. Um, in fact, we're gonna see that even more. If sneak preview, look up to verse 49 of the same chapter. In verse 49, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. One of the things that John, the writer of this gospel, the apostle John, uh, really majors on is this idea of the son of God. That's why I spent so much time talking about it last week because um, he, he does that more than all the other gospel writers. In fact, uh, John uh, uses the, the term in his book uh, six times by six, six different people. John chapter one, verse 18 that we read, uh, Nathaniel that I just read in John 1, 49, Peter's gonna call him the son of God in John six, uh, verses 69. 
Uh, and the blind man is also gonna call him the son of God there in John chapter nine, verses 35 through 38. Um, Martha, member of Mary and Martha, she's gonna call Jesus the son of God in John chapter 11. And then Jesus himself will refer to himself as the son of God twice, uh, John 5, 25 and John 10, 36. So this is a theme that you should probably be familiar with. How can Jesus be the son of God and uh, be one and the same as God the father? Um, the answer we covered that on last week, the mystery of the Trinity, the father son relationship. One thing that I didn't talk about is um, I've heard the critics say, well, um, isn't that kind of self-love? Uh, you know, God loves his only begotten son. This is my beloved son and who I'm well pleased. And you'll hear people say that about uh, cynically, the father-son relationship. I believe that this is God using a relationship that we can relate to, to describe something that uh, we probably fully won't ever really understand. The love that God had for his son uh, is something that we can, we can relate to a father's love for a son. Um, and, and if you're real critical of that, okay, I believe God loved his son. That's just loving yourself if, if he is God. You know, that's what they would say. But um, if, before you get too uh, all uppity about that one, don't forget one of the most popular verses in all the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, yes, God loved his only begotten son, but he also loved you and me that he was willing to give his beloved son. I think this is, a, this is what the Lord wants us to understand, the, the sacrifice that it was for God's son to come and live among us and die on the cross for the sins of the world. And uh, there you have it. So we, we've kind of looked at some of these things. This was sort of a review of verses one through 18. It's pretty chock full of important stuff. Um, as is the rest of this chapter. Um, so let's get to it. John chapter one, John the Baptist is now gonna spend some time talking about Jesus and he's gonna low profile himself. He's not gonna make it all about himself. This is a good ministry here of John the Baptist. We begin in verse 19. It says, and this was the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? <laughs> Now, what's interesting, if you know your Bible, um, does anybody know what occupation, if John wasn't eating locust uh, bugs legs twitching between, th between his teeth and wearing wild camel skins, what would, should his occupation have been? He was a priest. He was the son of a priest. He should have been in the temple in Jerusalem. Now you say, well, naughty John, why wasn't he in the priesthood, you know, doing what he was supposed to do? The answer is real simple. We looked at this, I think, in uh, Matthew's gospel, we talked about um, the priesthood had become so corrupt that John says, I'm not gonna be a part of that. And the Lord says, I'm gonna use John the Baptist to do something different. Um, that's important. Um, John, you know, God raised up John to be sort of an uncorrupted priest out of the wilderness. Um, by the way, there's an interesting sort of conundrum uh, because I see good and bad in this. Um, you know, throughout history, great revivals often came by someone who was an unlikely source, seemingly didn't have the same authority um, to make any change at all and was actually outside of the authority, like John the Baptist here. He's just out there in the wilderness eating bugs and stuff. And uh, what authority does he have? But the people saw an authority in John and they realized that the priests in Jerusalem were wacko. And they knew that about them. There was something off. And there's been times throughout history, like Martin Luther, for example, um, he was considered to be a rebel. Uh, the church was wrapped up in all kinds of biblical, or I should say non-biblical practices, biblical errors. Um, now, was Martin Luther correct in everything? No, he made some mistakes too. But I believe the Lord used him moving the church away from uh, some craziness. Uh, you know, and if you remember the Wittenberg door and the, 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 all that that happened there, it was, it was a time an outsider kind of came in and said, we got to fix some stuff. Um, uh, I think we've seen that in a lot of the revivals, even the Jesus movement in the 60s in Southern California, you know, a bunch of hippies coming to Christ and the established religious people were like, oh, hippies can't be saved, you know, with sand falling out their shorts when they're coming into church. Uh, like what's going on uh, there, you know? And um, the main denominations saw the, the Calvary Chapel movement. If you haven't seen the Jesus, Jesus Revolution movie, um, that's kind of the group that I was uh, growing up around when I was a kid, uh, the Jesus Revolution. That was kind of what we were a part of when I was a kid. And, uh, and I remember people, you know, the old school church people thought this is wacko. 
But, um, but I loved what happened in, in the early parts of that because uh, there, one of the things that Jesus Revolution didn't really get to in the movie, uh, unfortunately, was one of the key things that made that go. Um, and it wasn't even really represented in there. And, and, but that is Bible teaching. The Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, he was the, one of those guys that I'm gonna teach through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And so, you know, while the denominations were, you can't have hippies in the church. Meanwhile, Chuck Smith was teaching the Bible. Um, and as it turns out, there's no, there's no scripture that says hippies can't be in church. Um, uh, in fact, I think Jesus and his disciples might have been considered sort of hippies back in their day compared to others. Definitely John the Baptist would have been a hippie wearing camel skins and eating bugs out in the wilderness. Um, but um, I'm not arguing for hippiness, um, but I am uh, arguing that we have to be careful now. Um, some might say, well, Brett, that's what Joseph Smith did. He came out and saw corruption in the church and he uh, came and was correcting the, the misdirection of the church. And that's how LDS came about and the Mormons. Um, the, the one thing that you gotta really understand when you see somebody on the outside who's you know, making a stink within the church of Jesus Christ, you gotta understand, this is the key, you gotta go with whoever's teaching the Bible. It's the word, it's the word, it's the word. Chuck Smith went to the word in the Jesus Movement uh, revival. And, and the Calvary Chapels were very much committed back in those days to verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And it was, there was a revival because of the teaching of the word. Um, same thing with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was saying, what does the Bible really say versus what the Catholic Church was you know, forcing people to do? And he was getting back to the word. Martin Luther was interested in getting the word in people's hands. Uh, that, that's always a better move. Um, guys like Joseph Smith said, no, this is wrong. The word is wrong. So I'm gonna write a new one called the Book of Mormon to fix what was wrong in this one. Once that happens, you know, eh, that's not a fix. That's a person who's just on the outside and should not be let in. That's important to understand that. Uh, same with Jehovah's Witness. They rewrote the Bible, retranslated it, uh, the New World Translation and made up their own doctrines and stuff. You gotta go with what the Bible really says. And by the way, um, this is important because um, you know, uh, there needs to be revival today. And one of the things I, I believe that's key to revival is the word of God. If we could see churches get back to the book, you know, get back to the word of God, I think there'll be revival in this land. But, um, but as the more we get into people's opinions and doing little sermonettes for Christianettes uh, and wondering why the church is weak and uh, nobody, and we're having, you know, people, young people leaving the church in the droves and, you know, they're blaming everything but, the problem itself, I think the problem is we gotta get back to the word because the word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, by the way, um, a lot of different movements have come and gone. There's, I think there's a difference between you know, movements. Uh, I've watched you know, the Toronto Blessing movement come and go, where everybody's laughing in the spirit and the kind of Pentecostal movement, that always comes back around every 20 or 30 years, you know, and you watch that hyper kind of hyper, you know, uh, charismatic. We're charismatics just with safety belt. Um, the, the word is our safety belt. But, um, but it's sad to watch that come and go. I saw the seeker friendly thing come and go. It was all about making church, you know, marketing the church, make it comfy and entertaining and uh, make sure and have everything nice so the seekers can come. The mistake I think they made there was it was all about the seeker when the Bible says the father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. We kind of forgot who the real seeker is. It wasn't, you know, your next door neighbor that we're trying to impress. Uh, we want to worship and know in spirit and truth the Father who seeks those. We got the wrong seeker in the seeker-friendly movement. And then remember, maybe you remember the emergent church, remember the emergent church. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, that's where I think some of this that we see today was kind of the beginning of some derailing in the emergent movement. And then later it became more deconstructionist type stuff that we're seeing and people, but here's the problem with a lot of the deconstruction. It's the same problem as all the other times when everybody gets off the rails is what's lacking in the deconstruction movement. The word, I'm okay if somebody deconstructs as long as they say, we're gonna reconstruct with the Bible and exactly what the scriptures say, which probably was what your mom and dad and your pastor was telling you all along. See, that's the problem. A lot of people are going off to college. I'm deconstructing my faith and I'm gonna deconstruct because I, I've been hurt by the church. And like, that's a really bad reason to deconstruct. It really is. Uh, you gotta go back to the book, 
What does the Bible say? That's important. So uh, on and on, you know, we can talk about the irreligious movement of Portland. Uh, you know, everybody's proud and loud here in Portland saying we've become irreligious now. And that's what the statistics are telling us. Um, but important that any movement doesn't move away from biblical Christianity. That's what you have to really uh, watch out for. So we stick with the Bible, study the book, not a book. Um, do you guys remember during the seeker friendly movement uh, when everybody was doing 40 days of purpose in the church and they were reading the 40 days and I couldn't believe it. I was just shocked because, you know, uh, we have a better book. Like this is a really good book and 40 days is an okay book. Uh, I've got some problems with it, but you know, it's an okay book. 40 days of purpose. If you loved it, good for you, but it's not the Bible. If a church is replacing a book uh, other than the Bible, I think they've got off course. That's just my humble opinion. I would just challenge any pastor to say, let's just stick with the one. Give attendance to the reading of scripture, Paul told young Timothy. Uh, I'm not trying to be a jerk here, but I'm just saying, if you wanna fix the problem, it's the word, it's the word, it's the word, which really is Jesus. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, we, we see all that. Uh, so now John, John the Baptist, back to him, verse 19, um, uh, it says, um, you know, this guy, he was the wild one out in the wilderness and the priests are like, who are you? Like, uh, uh, and, and this is interesting because John the Baptist is gonna answer. In verse 20, he goes on, it says, and he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Don't you love his clarity here? He's, he's like, not, he's like, well, I'm pretty amazing. God's called me to be amazing. Uh, that's not what he's doing. I am not the Christ. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, none of us should try to um, sort of replace Jesus. I think that's one of the problems when you're in ministry. You wanna be Jesus to people, but you are not the Christ. It's a good thing to remember that you're not the Christ. John the Baptist is smart here. There's been times where I've wanted to counsel people and I wanted to sort of be the answer for them in their troubles and, and I hurt for them. So I wanted to help them, but I was trying to be Jesus. I'm not Jesus. And uh, one of the most refreshing things when you're in ministry is to realize you are not Jesus. And John the Baptist got that. He says, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? Which is the Greek way of saying Elijah. And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> I love this. John the Baptist is so humble uh, and he's always pointing to Jesus. Remember the whole John chapter three, verse 30. We're gonna get to that in a few weeks. Uh, you know, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's John the Baptist's whole thing. Um, and um, and I, 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 again, wanna just emphasize as we study John here that that should be the heart of Athey Creek. Um, I know that's the heart of our pastoral staff and uh, myself. We just, wanna, we just want Jesus to increase. We wanna decrease so that he might increase and, uh, and, and point, to people, point people to Jesus. That's our goal. Um, now, uh, what's interesting about this is they said in verse 21, what say then, art thou Elijah? And he said, I am not. Here's a question for you. Was John the Baptist, Elijah? Yes or no? <laughs> I always love this one. Yes and no, yes and no. Um, the answer is yes and no. That's right, <laughs> you're all correct. Um, and, and if you don't remember, I'm not gonna go into this full detail, but if you recall, um, remember in Matthew 21, verse 23, I'll just read it real quick. Jesus, uh, when, when he was come to the temple, the chief priests and elders, they said, by what authority do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing. If you tell me, um, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. If the baptism of John, whence was it from heaven or of men? Do you remember their answer? They didn't give an answer because they knew if they said he was of heaven, then they, they said, why did you persecute him? If he said he's of men, then the people would have said, no, John the Baptist was legit and they would have rejected them. So that's kind of the first thing. In Matthew chapter 11, um, verse, uh, verse 12, it says, Jesus, red letters, and from the days of John the Baptist to now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and violent will take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which is for to come. 
So Jesus said, guess what, John the Baptist, surprise. This is, this, John the Baptist is Elijah. So which one was it? Um, well, if you keep doing your study and, and follow through, um, you remember that uh, in Matthew, Mark, and John, if you put them all together, Jesus would say, if you can understand this, in essence, he's saying the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist. Um, so you know, whether he was John the Baptist or Elijah was John the Baptist, uh, was, he, was he not? Jesus said it, it, it mysteriously. He said, if you're able to receive this, this is Elijah, John the Baptist, which was for to come. Well, Brett, well, it seems like John the Baptist didn't know that then. Guess not. But uh, that's, that's when he said, I am not Elijah. I don't think he was just uh, being falsely humble. I, I think he hadn't really fully re re uh, received the idea that the spirit of Elijah had been upon him. That's what Jesus is saying. So kind of an interesting mystery. By the way, Elijah is gonna come in Jesus's day through John the Baptist but he's also gonna come in, I believe, the tribulation period. That's a whole nother discussion. So uh, Elijah keeps popping up throughout history. So previous studies on that, we, we've done that in detail. Uh, if you wanna learn a deep study, I think we did that in Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. We did a deep study on who, who is John the Baptist? Was he Elijah or not? But here he says, I am not. I just wanted to kind of bring that up. Now, uh, they, they would then say, verse 24, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees and asked him, said unto him, why baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Christ or Elias uh, or Elijah, neither that prophet? John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff here. So they're saying, if you're not the Messiah, or if you're not um, Elijah or whatever, then what in the world do you think you're doing out here baptizing people? Uh, being baptized in those days, uh, baptism was sort of a different deal. Um, there was a purifying of the Jews and they went through ceremonial cleansings, but that was a little different. Um, they did do a sort of a, a baptism for Gentiles who wanted to become practicing Jews. And they would do sort of a baptism ceremony in the you know, pre-New Testament era. Um, so that's kind of what these guys, what, what, what do you think you're doing baptizing? Um, does anybody remember John the Baptist baptism? Is, is that the same of the same baptism that you were baptized when you became a Christian and got baptized? Is it the same one? No, it is not. Um, remember when they realized, oh, you've only been baptized by John's baptism? Does anybody remember? What is John's baptism called? Baptism of repentance, remember? It's baptism to repentance. Now you say, well, Brett, that's what I did. I repented. Yeah, but that's really all John the Baptist. John the Baptist baptized demonstrating a recognition of one's sin. That is repentance. A desire for spiritual cleansing and a commitment to follow God's law, law in anticipation of the Messiah. That sort of defines uh, John the Baptist's baptism. Um, with John's baptism, a person repented, uh, therefore was ready to place his faith set up, ready, pre prepared to, to take, uh, uh, when, he, when they would meet Jesus. Remember, John the Baptist was all about preparing people to meet the Messiah, Jesus. Um, and what would that accomplish? Um, the, the John the Baptist uh, baptism accomplished the same thing the Old Testament sacrificial system did. It was pointing to what Jesus would do. Um, so, um, so the religious leaders are going, what in the world are you doing baptizing? Because they would convert Gentiles to Judaism, but what, what are you doing out here? Um, now, this is where, uh, by the way, when Jesus got baptized, you say, now I struggle because John the Baptist did baptize Jesus. And if John's baptism was to repentance, why would Jesus even have to be baptized? Well, if you remember, John the Baptist even protested that I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And John the Baptist was technically correct on that. But do you remember what Jesus would say, why he should be baptized? To fulfill all righteousness. In other words, uh, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's almost like baptism in the water with Jesus was very different than when you, when you got baptized, uh, guess what? We left sins in the river and we wa let them wash down and you came up a new creation in Christ. And man, there was a joyful thing that happened in your life. When Jesus was baptized, it was almost like um, the golden ticket. 
all of a sudden the sky opens up and the Lord says, ta-da, this is my beloved son. Uh, and the Holy Spirit comes down upon him. The point is Jesus was sinless. And when Jesus said, I'm gonna do this to fulfill all righteousness, it wasn't that he was just doing it because everybody else needed to do it. And he was just doing what everybody who wants to be righteous is doing. The idea is Jesus was fulfilling, fulfilling all righteousness, yours and mine and everyone else who's been a sinner. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill it. So when he was getting baptized, he was actually, that, was, that whole scene with God, we'll get to that in a second, but I just want you to know that, that was not uh, just your average baptism. That was actually God saying, this is why you're gonna be able to be saved right here because of what Jesus did. So, um, so John, John first introduces the Messiah at baptism, uh, which is kind of cool. By the way, I always kind of crack up because um, um, some of my Jewish friends in Israel struggle with, with some of the New Testament concepts. We were at, uh, where were we at? We were at Qumran, where they have all these baptisms from the Essenes, um, which, which, by the way, were kind of linked to John the Baptist directly. It's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls down there near the Dead Sea. And Qumran's a fun place to visit. But I remember this one guy, you know, uh, very Jewish, was explaining, you know, you Christians, you get it all wrong. You know, you guys, you guys are all baptized wrong because, you know, baptism is more of a thing where you don't have a person going in the water with you, getting baptized. And he started explaining how they would come down and ceremonially dip themselves. They wouldn't get tilted over by someone. They would just squat down and they were probably naked too. And I'm like, and, and here's what I saw happening. Uh, A.C. Creekers listening to this Jewish guy who was very, very smart, knew what he's talking about. Only the problem is he was talking about the Jewish baptism of the Old Testament. Um, and um, I'm not sure he understood this, but I kind of felt with our team of Athe Greekers there, they're all like, oh man, I got to go get baptized again because I had somebody baptize me and I, I had clothes on and, uh, and man, I guess I got to do it naked and I can't just be dipped. I got to squat down in the water. Like he was sort of, I think he didn't understand that he was doing that, but I had to kind of step in. Okay, listen, um, you know, God bless him. That's a great description of Old Testament baptism. Um, and then he said, yeah, but you guys, you don't, need, you, know, you don't need to have somebody get in the water and baptize with you. That's, that's just something creation of the church. And I'm saying, no, that's a creation of the word of God. And we kind of had a nice friendly debate, you know, and I said, remember John the Baptist even went in and baptized Jesus. Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, the eunuch said, what hinders me from being baptized? And, and he said, here's water. And, uh, and then Philip said, well, let's go. And Philip took the guy down in the water, them, them together, and uh, you know, did the baptism. Now, John the Baptist's baptism was that of repentance, repentance and cleansing, but Jesus's baptism, and from that day forward, the, the baptism that we see in the New Testament would be um, our, our being buried with Christ, being resurrected, even as Christ rose from the grave. So that's why my Jewish friend didn't understand. We were actually being biblical in the way that we baptized. Now, if you were baptized with sprinkling, or baptized with um, you know immersion by squatting or whatever. Don't worry about it. You know, did you did you was your heart right? Did you know what you were doing? If you didn't, by the way, if you were an infant and you had butt sprinkling, uh, then you weren't really baptized because the Bible says repent and be baptized. Baptism is a decision you make that you cognitively should under, understand what you're doing. And you weren't that, it was your loving mother and grandma said, oh, let him be baptized as a baby. And the church said, yeah, 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 come on in, we'll sprinkle your baby. But nowhere in the Bible do you see that. There's no infant baptism in the scriptures. I, I want you to know that. I've never had one person show me an example of that. What you always see in the Bible as far as baptism is a person willingly going into the water, understanding what it meant. Uh, you know, as an outward sign of an inward commitment to Christ. Uh, Jesus waited until he was 30 before he got baptized. Uh, I wonder how, what age you should have been. Did you understand what you were doing? If you were an old enough kid to understand what you're doing, then great. But um, I would recommend if you were too little and you don't remember it and it didn't have any meaning to you, then baptism is something you've, I think you're missing out on. Uh, it's a get to, it's a beautiful thing. So, um, so for, for us, baptism is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. That's why uh, many scholars believe that the New Testament church baptism came to this dunking backwards, like being laid in the grave and coming forward. I'm not arguing for a technique of baptism. I'm just saying that's why we do that. Um, uh, by the way, the speaking on the naked thing, uh, probably shouldn't talk about this, but... Um, <laughs> When I was a kid, I, I told you I was in the hippie movement uh, church. And I remember this one time after a, like, it was like, I think it was a midweek study or something. Uh, this, this family said, we want to be baptized. They were coming right out of the woods from being hippies, you know? 
And so we all went down to this pond near the house to do this baptism. And all of a sudden the family walked out, the whole family stark naked. Uh, now you have to understand in Southern Oregon at that time, that was something you saw a lot. There was a lot of, you know, skinny dippers and that was just kind of the hippie thing, running around with no clothes. So uh, I remember our pastor was kind of like, oh, and, and he, he just had the family come in and he got them all about neck deep in the water. Okay, uh, and he explained <laughs> baptism to them. <laughs> And then he dunked them. Uh, and then this was great. I remember as a kid just going, what are they going to do? You know, And uh, all these n- nice ladies in our church, they, they got some big like sheet towels you know, and, and came out and just gave them big hugs you know, and wrapped them with a towel. Uh, it, was, it worked flawlessly. Uh, it was perfect. But um, later on, that family uh, just became a solid part of our church. I think they're still part of the church to this day uh, and uh, driving Beamers now and stuff. But um, <laughs> different family. Where was I? Oh yes, <laughs> baptism. So when John says, I, I baptize you with water, um, but there standeth one among you, that's Jesus whom you know not, he's coming. Um, and he's saying, I'm not even worthy to unloose his, his, again, this humility, loose the latchet on his shoe. Um, and now John the Baptist was ba- baptizing in Bethabara, which is, uh, he was on the east side of the Jordan River. He was actually in the country of Jordan today. Um, you always picture John the Baptist somewhere in Israel, but he's actually in Jordan and he was down closer to the Dead Sea um, than uh, most people. When you go to Jer- or, uh, when you go as a tourist, there's a lot of baptismal sites on the Jordan River and they're all really pretty. Um, the reason they don't do it where John the Baptist did it is because it's not pretty at all. It's just a desert and weeds and it's not lovely, uh, but it, it, it's not, you know, it doesn't matter. I just thought that's kind of funny. They always pick the beautiful spots for baptism. Uh, but Jesus was baptized in kind of the desert area down by the Dead Sea. Well, all that to say, okay, so we got the, um, you know, these, these titles. That we're gonna introduce to another one here, um, one that we looked at on Sunday. So we got the Word, we got the Light, we got the Son of God, and now we're gonna add to the list um, here uh, the Lamb of God, starting in verse 29. And we looked at this on Sunday, but we'll dive into it again here. Verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. This is is where John is saying, he preexisted me. Verse 31, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that, um, he that sent me to baptize with water upon uh, the, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the son of God. This is John's record. Jesus got baptized. We know from the other gospels, kind of a, the clear description of this is in you know, Matthew and others, where it talks about you know, Jesus baptized, the Holy Spirit coming. But um, interesting that Jesus is the one here, um, the same is the one which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And we'll talk more about baptism of the Holy Ghost and what that is. Remember the three relationships we talk about? The Holy Spirit is with you, in you, and upon you. And I believe that this is talking about that upon experience that's gonna come in Acts chapter two. Um, And Jesus is the source of that. I thought the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is is the power behind the baptism. But remember Jesus in John 14 and John 16 said, it's expedient that I'm gonna leave you. And I'm sure the disciples are like, no, we don't want you to leave us. Why is it expedient? Or why is it good that you're leaving us? Because there's one coming after me, Jesus said. I'm sending my comforter, capital C, the Spirit and the Spirit's gonna come upon you. And there's a long list there in John 14 and John 16 of the wonderful things the Holy Spirit's gonna do uh, for uh, the the disciples and the early church. So, um, but but the main theme here that we're seeing is um, there in verse 29, behold the Lamb of God. And we talked about the significance of the Lamb uh, that that is uh, so important. Now, um, we saw Jesus sort of, Luke's, or pardon me, John's description of baptism is, is actually pretty vague compared to some of the others. But remember, Jesus got baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And this is also the point to introduce the Messiah 
um, and to make him known. That's, that's what John the Baptist says. Um, I, I, you know, I knew him not, but, verse 33, he that sent me to baptize with water, the same uh, is gonna um, set unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, uh, remaining on the same as him which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Um, that's what John the Baptist, his whole life was for that point. Um, should that be your and my life goals to bear witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I think so. Um, how would John the Baptist know that his cousin Jesus really was the Messiah? Do you think he ever had doubts? You should know the answer to that question. Did John the Baptist ever have doubts? Yes, he did. Shocker, huh? He, he was John the Baptist. Do you remember there in Matthew 11 where um, John was in prison? And oftentimes, when, when do you and I doubt the most? It's when we're down, when we're in a state of blues or depression. Uh, there's poor John the ba Baptist stuck in prison. Um, in Matthew 11, verses two through six, you know, it says when John um, heard of the, the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples uh, and Jesus uh, answered those disciples and said, go and show John, you know, those things which you do in here and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead's even been raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And then the disciples went and told uh, John the Baptist, oh, he says he's the one, look at the stuff he's doing. And then after the disciples leave, Jesus turns and says to everybody, oh, by the way, John the Baptist is the greatest guy ever born among women. That's when he said that. Um, I kind of wonder why didn't Jesus say that before the disciples left? Like, yeah, I'm the one. And by the way, John the Baptist, you're a really great guy. Go tell him that. But Jesus didn't do that. Uh, do you ever wonder why? Um, maybe not to give John the Baptist a big head. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, that, that might be. Uh, that's probably why he doesn't say that to me. Um, but um, all that to say, John the Baptist, he's constantly saying, behold the lamb. This is the lamb, not a lamb, your lamb. Remember we talked about that on Sunday. Behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Um, I love John the Baptist's whole demeanor, the way he presents everything. It's, it's a real, it's a model. There's something for you to maybe meditate on this week is, am I needing to get a little more John the Baptist-y in my behavior, in what I do? Am I, should I be more, you know, instead of pointing to me, pointing to Jesus and pointing everyone to Jesus? And just a reminder, this is a really good time to point people to Jesus. Um, you know, Resurrection Sunday is a time you can say, hey, come and, you know, celebrate, you know, what we Christians, you know, really rejoice in that Jesus, he, he died on the cross for our sins, but he also rose from the grave. Um, and that's such a, some people are blown away that we believe that someone, he died and rose from the grave. But, um, you know, hopefully this Resurrection Sunday, people will hear the good news of the gospel. That's John the Baptist, his whole thing. Well, so the Lamb of God, we see that in, in verse uh, 36 and verse 29. And then we pick it up in verse um, 35, uh, where we're gonna see the next uh, title. I know I'm jumping around with scriptures and titles, but this is what this chapter is showing us, all these titles. He's not only the Word, the Light, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, but he's also gonna be called the Messiah. Let's read verse 35. It says, and again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Um, interesting, John had disciples. Uh, did you know that? Um, we, we haven't really mentioned that yet in this particular study, but um, those who he would teach. John the Baptist was teaching. Uh, now, who were these two? These were two disciples that, as it says here, the two disciples heard him speak, and then they followed Jesus. So they left John the Baptist. Were those two disciples um, uh, in error to leave their former you know, tutorial guy uh, or disciple or uh, John the Baptist to, to, to leave him for Jesus? Um, no, this is good. Following Jesus is always the better plan. By the way, if you're feeling sorry for John the Baptist because his followers started following Jesus, that was John the whole Baptist's whole purpose, to point people to Jesus. So to John the Baptist, he would have been leaping for joy that his disciples graduated uh, from, uh, from him to actually following Jesus. Um, when did they decide to uh, follow Jesus. It says here, when they heard him speak, when, he heard, when they heard him speak, they followed Jesus. How do you and I have faith to follow Jesus? 
the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the Bible says. I like how these disciples, they, they follow Jesus because they hear him speak. That's kind of a key. Then in verse 38, the first part, it says, um, uh, then, then they turned and saw them following and, uh, and saith unto them, first red letters, by the way, red alert, <laughs> first red letters in John. And what does he say? What seek ye? So these two disciples following Jesus, he turns around, hey, what do you guys, what do you guys want? What are you seeking? Now, do you, do you wonder, was he wondering what they were looking for? You know, I don't think Jesus asked this because he didn't know what they were seeking, but I think he, he is whatever they needed. What seek ye? Because Jesus is the one that we should all seek. Um, whatever you're looking for in life, it can be found in Christ. Um, uh, but Brett, what if I want to get a Ferrari? Um, well, do you really want that? Because if it's not found in Christ, you're probably not really going to want that Ferrari. Uh, same with the job, same with the spouse or whatever thing you think you want. It's better to follow Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. So I love that. You know, uh, he says, what seek you? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? Where are you living? And verse 39, he said unto them, come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with them that day, for it was about the 10th hour. I love this invitation. Um, one of the fun studies to do is all the invitations of Christ. Come unto me, all you who are weary and have a, come unto me or come and see. I love that. Um, there's an old Bob Bennett song, uh, Come and See, that's uh, really cool. The invitations that Jesus, follow me uh, and I will make you fishers of men. What is the Lord inviting you to do is a good question. But for these guys, come and see. Um, uh, and they would come and they would see for themselves the goodness and the wonder that Jesus would bring and salvation. Now, it says they came uh, and um, you know they dwelt and abode with them that day for it was about the 10th hour. Um, now, some of your newer translations put weird times and stuff, and there's a debate. Um, is it 10 a.m. or 4 a.m.? Or 4 p.m., I should say. 4 p.m. or 10 a.m.? You say, Brett, what does that matter? This gets people all up in a tizzy, and it shouldn't, because um, uh, they get all upset. What time of day was it? Uh, uh, sorry, monk, but it doesn't really matter what time of day it was. Uh, what time? Um, now, here's why there's controversy about was it, was it 10 a.m. or 4 p.m.? It depends on whether you're using the Roman time system or the Jewish time system. And you're gonna see that in the Bible. Uh, the, the, even there's apparent discrepancies on times in the gospel messages. Um, and, and don't let that bug you because sometimes it was more of a Roman time system. Remember the Romans had been oppressively over the, that region for a lot of years. And a lot of people had adopted the Roman system of timekeeping. Um, but if you're using the Jewish one, uh, it's 10 a.m. If you're using the Roman system, it's 4 p.m. Uh, so most scholars believe it was probably the 10 a.m. time. Uh, I, I just use this as a springboard to make you think about what time system they must be using. And you have to be careful uh, in the gospels about that. Well, verse 40, um, then it says, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Um, now, uh, who's Andrew? What do we know about Andrew? Well, not much. Andrew's one of the disciples. There's not a lot of ink in the Bible. Um, we don't ever read a sermon given by Andrew. Um, if, if you were a Bible character, who would you want to be? Have you ever thought about that? If your name made it to the pages of the Bible, um, you know who I'd want to be? I'd want to be one of the guys that got off really good with just a little bit of ink. Like think about David. Oh, I want to be David. Really? I have a loathsome disease in my loins. <laughs> That's what David said. That's embarrassing, man. <laughs> or, or David, murdering uh, Uriah that time and committing adultery. Like the guys that get a lot of ink in the Bible, they, you know, the Bible doesn't pull any punches. But there's guys like Andrew who we just, you know, the only thing we really see Andrew doing is bringing people to Jesus. Um, that's kind of Andrew's thing. He's not a loud guy. He's not the, you know, his, his, his brother is the big mouth, Peter. But Andrew's the guy who's just like real quiet, but just always bringing people to Jesus. I love that. It, it kind of reminds me of Enoch. We don't know much about Enoch, but what we do know in the Bible, is it says he walked with God and he pleased God and the Lord took him up to heaven. Uh, that's all we really know. It's an amazing guy. So little is known about Andrew, except for this, he led people to Jesus. So notice that's what he's doing here. Um, 
there, uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew starts following him, Simon Peter's brother. And then verse 41, he first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Um, now, let's, let's talk about this. We've talked about the word Christos and the word Messiah. Um, Messiah, for, for a Hebrew person, that meant uh, king or anointed one. In fact, let me show you. There's just, there's just the difference between the Greek and the Hebrew. When you use the word Messiah um, or Mashiach, means anointed or king. Um, Christos, or where we get our word Christ, is the anointed one. It's the same thing. But um, remember, I told you this before, the Jews thought of the, the word Messiah as just a king generally too. So they would have called King Saul a Messiah, King David a Messiah, King Hezekiah a Messiah. That's what they would have done. But the prophets did speak of the Messiah, the big one, the most anointed of them that was coming. And that's who these guys are referring to. So when, when Andrew says to Simon, we have found the Messiah, not just the king in general, but the king is what he's talking about, which is being interpreted the Christ or Christos, uh, which means the anointed. So don't be confused by Christ and Messiah. They're really the same word. One's Greek and one's Hebrew. Um, kind of important thing. So um, uh, by the way, the, um, the king of kings um, was what they were hoping for. There were two schools of thought in this time when they were waiting for the coming Messiah which is kind of interesting. Um, one school of thought was that the king of kings was gonna come and rule over all the nations and it would be a Jew who would do that. There was, however, another school of thought that said the king will come and be beaten, hated, and rejected. And if you, it, you as, a, as a Christian Bible reader, we, kinda, we know where they got that kind of idea when Isaiah the prophet talked about him being wounded for our transgressions, despised, rejected, all that stuff. Um, so those two schools of thought, He's gonna be king of kings and rule over nations or he'll be beaten, hated, and rejected. And people argued back and forth a lot. It was a heated debate back in those days. Question, which one of them were right? Both of them are right. How can both be right? How could he be a beaten, rejected, hated king uh, at the same time be a king of kings and rule over all the nations? The answer, he's God. I would say that to my Calvinist Arminius friends. How can one both be true? He's God and you're not. Uh, stop trying to be God. Uh, you know, it's funny. The, the answer is God works it out. The anointed one who is brutally beaten and despised, yet he's going to come and rule and reign as king of kings. Both were true. Um, the, the, the Jews didn't understand that Christ would come in two advents. The first coming, born in a manger in Bethlehem. Second one, uh, second coming of Christ, the riding in on a white horse in Revelation 19. Um, don't get too frustrated, by the way, on in-house church debates about stuff. I, I see people, um, and you know, it's funny because the, the scholarly brainiac types, if, if we want to, you know, debate Calvinism versus the Arminian thinking and all that, great. It's an interesting discussion and it's, it's worth working and studying. <clears throat> but if, if it's, it, one thing I think that the scholarly types forget is you are derailing a lot of people who haven't really, barely, they're still trying to figure out, is Jesus the Christ who died on the cross for my sins. Meanwhile, you're, you know, hating each other, yelling at each other about Calvinism and stuff. I think that we need to go back and realize, let's remember what's really important here. Essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Those are important. Um, you know, views even that I believe passionately. I, I, I believe, you know, studying eschatology, end times in the Bible is really important, but it should not be a, a topic that divides and makes people you know, that are within the Christian church be angry at each other. We, we can talk about it, it's an in-house debate, at least it should be. I've noticed there's a ramping up, just like in the secular world, nobody can talk about anything anymore. Um, I'm seeing that in the church today. If you're a pre-trib, you know, pre-millennial Christian, there's people out on YouTube yelling and screaming and saying they're not even, they're false teachers and all this stuff. It's just kind of comical uh, if it wasn't so sad and tragic. Uh, let's remember the main thing. The main thing is uh, the essential doctrines ar around Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> so um, what was Andrew's view? Have you ever thought about that? <clears throat> when Andrew comes and says, he's the Messiah, which has interpreted the Christ. Um, I, I wonder if he had the version one that he's gonna come and rule the nations of the world or the one that's gonna be beaten. The disciples seem to almost always lean toward the one where he's gonna become the king of all nations. That was what they seemed to all sort of expect. 
and they were surprised when he was despised and rejected. Well, verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus, uh, and when Jesus beheld him, that is Peter, he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Um, so you say, Brett, I'm confused. I thought his name was gonna be called Peter, which is the word Petra, um, and the English word is rock or pebble, um, right? The, the, the reason he's called Cephas, there's, there's several languages going on here. Um, Cephas is the Aramaic word. I know that, uh, you know, we Americans, we struggle when we start crossing different languages, but um, a lot, there's a lot of countries that still live with three or four languages that they live next to each other. Um, that's kind of what happens in the Middle East, even to this day. So we shouldn't be shocked that Jesus, they're using Aramaic words, they're using uh, Greek words. Um, uh, so uh, Simon uh, is the, the first, the first his name that was given to him. Um, and it's hard to find uh, what Simon actually means. What was Simon Peter's original name? I've heard, you know, sermons from pastors I love and know uh, say, say his name means shifting sand, uh, which would be kind of cool. It's a good sermon. He went from shifting sand to Mr. Rock. Solid, that's a great sermon. But I've nowhere been able to find that Simon means shifting sand, nowhere. In any lexicon or Greek study book or anything ever. So I, I'm not gonna say that. But what does Simon mean? Don't know. But Jesus says, you're called Simon, but you're gonna get a new name. And it's gonna be um, both Cephas or Peter. Cephas being Aramaic, Peter being Greek, both mean rock or pebble. Um, this could be, you know, Jesus, uh, like, you know, you know, when he, when he describes this, he's thinking of what's going to happen in Matthew chapter 16. Remember in Matthew 16, who do you say that I am? And Peter finally, after all the other ideas that everybody came up with, Peter said, you're the Mashiach, you're the, you're the, the Messiah, the Christos. Uh, and Jesus said, blessed are you Simon bar Jonah, which means son of Jonah, Simon, for flesh and blood is not, has, has not revealed this to you, but my father. And he said that thou art Peter. So this is where Peter gets called his new name is when he declares Jesus as the Messiah. And then, um, did Peter rock, uh, act like a rock from that day forward? No. When did Peter act more like a rock? After the resurrection, after the Holy Spirit came upon him. Not until he was filled with the Holy Spirit did Peter become sort of uh, Rocky Balboa. Uh, or the rock. Uh, I think that's important to understand that. Uh, that's the key. Um, question, what's gonna be your new name given? Uh, did you know that there's, there's an indication that you might be given a new name? Is anybody excited about that? I'm kind of excited about losing the name Brett. There's too much associated with it that I'm kind of embarrassed about. And I'm looking forward to a new name. Revelation 2.17 says, you know, Jesus says, he who is ear to hear, let him hear what he says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give hidden manna, will give him a white stone and a, in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that will receive it. I wonder if you'll be given a new name. Names matter. The Bible, how many times does God change the name of people? Abram and Sarai went to Abraham and Sarah. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing when you hear, hear these names shifted. Um, what name will you be shifted to? Valiant? Brave? The Terminator? Bob? Well, what's going to be your name in, in heaven? Uh, I wonder. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I remember this little girl came up to me and asked me uh, a Bible question. And it's always the kids that stump me. Um, they, they come up with these hard questions, you know. But one question, this girl says, what does the name Mary mean? And I was like, oh man, I was thinking and racking my brain. And I, I remember reading somewhere chosen one. And so I, th I, but I couldn't say for sure. And I think I said, well, you know, I, I think it's, it, um, Mary means chosen one. And, um, and I thought, okay, you know, and then she said, okay, cool. Um, but then I, I had to talk to her. I looked for the kid the next Sunday because I told her incorrectly. Does anybody know what the name Mary actually means? Bitter. Who would have thought the mother of Jesus would be? I went home and looked it up. I'm like, oh man, I gotta go tell that girl. Mary's name means bitter. And then I realized where I got the name, the chosen one. It's, it, do you remember back when we used to have Christian bookstores? Now it's all online, but I remember going to the Christian bookstore and they always had the rack with the cups and the names and all what the fancy names meant. And I was always laughing because none of those were accurate. 
I remember you'd come to James, the cup of James, and it means truthful one. And I was like, wait a minute, James, I know what that name means. It means deceitful one. Like if you look at your Bible, that's what, sorry, James, if your name is James out there. Um, I like to remind James Shields of that one once in a while, one of our pastors, it means deceitful. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but Mary, I, the cup said, you know, chosen one, because that looks so good on a cup and it sells at Christian bookstores. But, um, but you know, I, I kind of think that all of us sort of have ruined our name. Uh, and I, I think that there's gonna be something beautiful when we go up to be with the Lord, the Lord's gonna give us a new name and it's gonna be something better. It, and there's all kinds, you know, Jacob, which is where the word James comes from. Jacob means deceitful, heel snatcher, but the Lord changed his name to Israel, which means governed by God. So that's gonna happen. Well, we gotta finish up this chapter. Um, so back to our list, we've got these, these uh, titles given to Jesus, the King of Israel, the Mashiach, uh, verses 43 through 49. Um, that's, that's the next one we're gonna see here. In verse 43, um, it says, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and said unto him, follow me. Another invitation, I love that. Um, there, and it goes on in verse 44. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, we have found him of whose Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Um, the son of Joseph, by the way, not m mean, you know, more legal term of who Jesus was, um, but it, it's, that's the way they identified. Uh, that was kind of like a last name, Bar. Bar Joseph uh, would be the son of Joseph. Um, and in verse 45, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Um, they weren't blindly following Jesus. They were, they were saying, this is a confirmation of what the word told us. That's important to understand the, the, that these guys were following Jesus backed by scripture. But notice Nathaniel's response we see in verse 46. And Nathaniel said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, come and see. I love Philip. He's already um, modeling himself after Jesus. Verse 39, Jesus' first red letters, or the second red letters, come and see. Philip's saying the same thing now. Uh, you're always on safe ground if you're using words of Jesus. Come and see. And, and I like his answer because it's not, you know, uh, witty or sarcastic, uh, you know, uh, Nathaniel's being sarcastic. Can any good thing? Go? It'd be like, um, you know, you find out somebody who's really uh, on fire Christian. You're like, where are they from? Portland. <laughs> Debbie and I were down in Austin, Texas a few weeks ago. And, um, and these Christians would come up, where are you from? Where are y'all from? You know, and, and we'd say Portland. And they go, oh. <laughs> and you could hear it. Can any good thing? You could almost hear it in their brain can any good thing come from Portland, you know? And they would just, oh, how are you surviving up there? And it's like, barely. Oh, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't say that, I didn't say that. Well, anyway, can any good thing um, come out of Nazareth? Be careful, by the way, um, just, just because he, they, they were actually technically wrong. He, uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem um, and he lived in Nazareth, but technically Bethlehem was where he's from. Um, and so he gives him that invitation. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming uh, to him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Now I love this because Jesus is saying something that's kind of like politically incorrect. Um, uh, how do I say this without, I'm just gonna say this because Jesus said it, but Jews have somewhat of a reputation especially when it comes to business and stuff like that. And, and people use this for anti-Semitism, uh, you know, to try to further those Jews, you know, who are, you know, and they accuse Jews of this and that, but the Jews are very shrewd. Um, and, uh, but the, the reputation of that day was the Jews were dishonest, like don't trust the Jew. And Jesus is jumping on that kind of in a shocking way. Wow, a Jew that's actually honest. That's what Jesus is saying here. We, we get it in the King Jimmy. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. And you're like, oh, that, that sounds like a compliment. Kinda. But it, it was a compliment, but it was also Im implying that there's a lot of deceit in the rest of Israel and in the rest of Jews. Um, now, you say, Brett, should Jesus have said that? Well, Jesus can say that because he's God and he knows everyone, 
really well. You and I should be more careful because we don't know everyone. Uh, but Jesus is, is saying something that w- w- would have stood out. Now, Nathaniel must have been a guy that was not deceitful. And so suddenly he's winning, Jesus is winning him over with what? Truth. Check it out. Um, verse 48, it says, and Nathaniel said unto him, whence knowest thou me? Like, how, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. What was it that was going on here? You know, um, interesting, in the first century, Jewish rabbis would instruct their students to find a place of seclusion under an olive vine or under a fig tree to study and pray. Um, I'm reminded of Jeremiah 29, 13. You shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Um, And there's things that Jesus, only Jesus could have known. No one else would have known that Nathanael was under that fig tree seeking after the Lord. And the Lord says, I I know about that. Um, and, And it was so moving to Philip. Have you ever heard somebody say, this happened in my life? And you're like, oh, that's just a coincidence. And I can't believe they believe in God because of that little story that they just told. Yeah, but to a lot of people, when, you, when, you, when the Lord meets you in kind of miraculous ways, it is kind of hard to explain to everybody else, but you just know. You know when the Lord did something in your life and other people might dismiss it as coincidence or you're just making more out of it. But there's a lot of times where I've, I've noticed Christians will actually have confirmation. The Lord will just show up in ways like he did to Nathaniel here. Jesus knows stuff that is only known by him. Um, uh, remember the woman at the well in John chapter four, we'll see this in a few weeks, where the woman ran into town, come and see a man which told me all the things that I've ever done. Is not this the Messiah? She says, um, that's, that's kind of the idea. Uh, theme in the book of John, come and see. The lady at the well, come and see this man. And uh, uh, Philip saying, come and see, I love that. Well, um, by the way, uh, can, can the Lord give you a word of knowledge like Jesus had there, where Jesus spoke into him? I, I saw you when you're under the fig tree and uh, the Lord you know, was doing something there with you. I saw you there. Um, can the Lord give you a word of knowledge? Yes, it's one of the manifestations of the spirit. Be really careful with that one though, because I grew up in an era where everybody who'd been smoking a little too much weed said, thus saith the Lord. And they'd walk up to you. Man, I saw that so many times, it was so wacko. Um, If you're gonna say that, you better be filled with the spirit and saying the right thing. Um, I remember there was a trend where young single guys would walk up to the girl of their dreams. The Lord told me that you are to marry me. Thus saith the Lord. And I had to instruct our young girls, you know, because I was the director of the college group back at the time, I'd say, just say this, the Lord says to take the false prophets out and stone them to death. <laughs> that's, what I t- that's what I told them. Uh, don't be a weirdo when it comes to this, but because of misuse, we've done away with kind of a word of knowledge or speaking a word into someone's life. Um, but I think when it's used correctly and rightly, it's one of the beautiful works of the spirit. Um, well, all that to say, um, it goes on. It says, um, uh, Nathaniel says, you know, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. That, that's the Messiah. And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said unto thee, I saw the end of the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Um, so, um, you know, this is, this is uh, back to our list here. Um, we've got, you know, number one, the Word, the Light, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the King of Israel. Um, and then number seven, the Son of Man. Is that, that's number seven on our list. Um, it says that right here. Uh, uh, um, this, Jesus gives him that self that title there in verse 51. You'll see the, the descending, the angels of God descending upon the Son of Man. Now you say, Brett, what is this all about? Do you remember in the book of Genesis, um, where we've got the story of Jacob running from Esau and he wrestles with God and he pops his hip out of joint, changes his name from Jacob to Israel. It's quite a story. But um, after that, he's of course tired. So he goes to sleep, but he gets pillows uh, out of stones. Uh, you colored that in Sunday school. And you're like, man, uh, what is it? A soft pillow for, uh, for a good, good conscience? Or he didn't have a good conscience. He was horrified of Esau's son. And then suddenly he dreams this dream where Jacob's ladder, as they call it, 
but a ladder or a stairway going from heaven, angels ascending and descending. And the Lord met with him. In fact, it's Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. It says, and he dreamed and beheld a ladder set up on earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. You say, well, what does that have to do with this? Well, this is what Jesus is referring to. Remember how I keep telling us over and over, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. Well, the ladder was Jesus. I mean, that's amazing. All throughout the Bible, everything points to Jesus. But that, how is that ladder um, of Jacob's ladder, speaking of Jesus? Jesus is the one who bridges the gap between heaven and earth, between God and man. Only Jesus is the path to heaven. And Jesus is gonna show how that is, how that works out when he says, um, you're gonna see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. And that's, that's what he's going to uh, demonstrate in the rest of the book of John. So next week, we'll pick it up uh, where he does a miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. Uh, so there you have it. Let's pray together. Lord, as we uh, finish up this chapter, I pray that uh, once again, we'd see your son Jesus more clearly, um, even as the invitation to come and see. I pray that we would do that uh, daily, that we'd come and see how good your word is and how your son Jesus did everything to make the way straight for us, to be the, the ladder ascending and descending up to heaven, Lord, only through your son, Jesus. Um, I pray that we would uh, have faith as we uh, look to the word that faith would come by hearing and hearing by your word. So bring forth good fruit in our lives tonight, we pray as we go our way in Jesus' name, amen.